Okay, thank you everyone for coming to the Parrot Club. And tonight we're gonna to be hearing about macaws of Bolivia, specifically the blue-throated macaw. And I'm proud to have Bennett Hennessy here, who is now the development director of Armonia Bolivia, or Sociación Armonia, since the correct name, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he's also, also a consultant with uh, American Bird Conservancy. Bennett used to be the CEO of Armonia, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's up. So uh, Bennett grew up in Toronto, where he completed a customized zoology and environmental science degree at the University of Toronto. He did field work in the Congo for a year and lived with the rainforest pygmies. He's lived in Bolivia for over 20 years and has raised over $4 million for bird conservation uh, since 2003. Additional bird conservation experience includes tour guiding, surveys, re reserve design, trail creation, presentations, lodge creation, and writing. He speaks English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. And he's going to talk to us about the Barba Azul Nature Reserve, which is the blue-throated macaw reserve. And I won't even say anything more about that because I'm sure he'll tell us all about that. So thank you so much for joining us today, Ben, and I'm really happy you could speak to us from, from quarantine. And for those of us who who have been in the club a long time, you remember he came to the club in person back in 2012. So it's really nice that we can have him back again today. All <laughs> yours, Bennett. Thanks. Um, pleased to be here. Um, and yeah, as Amy mentioned, there's the chat line there, so you can put in a question or what have you there, and we can get to it in the middle of the talk or after, it depends. So I'm gonna share my screen here, share. And that. There we go. Okay, is that is that working? Uh, I just heard a macaw scream, so I think so. And you're seeing you're seeing this the, the two macaws perched there. Yes. Okay, so I'll just I'll just go and let me know. Okay, yeah, so these are blue-throated macaws. Um, I'm going to talk to you about our latest conservation efforts with the blue-throated macaws in Bolivia. Um, I, I am now, I was the executive director for 13 years, and now I'm the development director, which is basically searching for money, which is basically what I mostly do when I was a director in for Asociación Armonía, and that's a, it's a bird conservation group in, in Bolivia. Um, my other part of my job is with, uh, I need to move this for a second, there we go. Um, is a, with American Bird Conservancy in Brazil. We're working on projects with Lear's macaw, gray-breasted parakeet, guayais parakeet, sun conure. So I sort of, I do have two hats in that. Um, in Armonia, we work on the threatened birds, birds that are going to ex get extinct. So we have a very clear uh, 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 protocol on, on how we're working. Uh, Palca chupa cotinga, the ch uh, uh, Cochabamba mountain finch, some of these sort of smaller threatened birds that are disappearing. These are the Polylepis highlands in the Bolivia. We have projects here, um, a lot about habitat protection, but the birds have disappeared because of the lack of the forest there. Um, this is the horned curacao, probably the most threatened bird in Bolivia. We're working on protecting that. And then two macaw species, the red-fronted macaw, which is endemic to Bolivia as well. Um, it's found in the dry valleys of the Andes, um, so further down from the, the moist cloud forests. And it, it's a colonial breeder on cl um, nesting cliffs. And I have a little video here, two minutes long, of, of one of the sites that we're working in and we're trying to help uh, tourism to support the local community that are protecting the bird. So I'll just put that on.
Okay, so that's um, uh, what the uh, that's the one endemic macaw species we're working on, and obviously help train and support conservation with tourism, which we hope will happen again next year. And then I'm going to be talking about the blue-throated macaw. So these are them. Um, so just to give you some bearings, uh, South America, a map of South America, you can see the Amazon River up there above, and that's Lake Titicaca as a reference point. So you can see that there's uh, the high area of the Andes, a very sort of flat area of the Andes, and then but a lot of Bolivia is also lowlands, and that's sort of the map of Bolivia, there's Lake Titicaca again. Now, the, what's been said is that you couldn't have put a country in a better spot in South America to cover more habitat types. So we have a variety of habitats within Bolivia, which is why we have a, a high diversity of birds, including parrots. So tropical humid forests, we have mountain forests, which is called Yungas, cloud forest, the, the temperate dry forest, that's the habitat of the red front of macaw. We also have the Pantanal, which is the habitat of the hyacinth macaw. That population is mostly in Brazil, but we also have it in Bolivia. And then the Beni Savannas, and that's, that's where we're gonna be today. So uh, Beni Savannas are mostly savanna, it's sort of a mosaic of what they call gallery forests, forests near rivers, forest islands, which are raised areas, and then savanna and a, a series of variations on that, that grassland theme. The, the area is very um, particular as it floods through the rainy season, which, oh, which hold on, I'll get to actually, hold on. Um, so so that, that whole area, it's about the size of Texas. No, hold on, I'll, keep, I'll get to it. 420,000 people, about 10 million cows. So it is mostly ranching land, mostly private ranches. Um, 468,000 uh, square miles, which is about half the size of Texas. So it is a very large area of Bolivia. Um, and and the, the one element that is very particular and why it's a natural savanna, it has a very strong dry season. So from June to October, there's almost no rain. And then from January to March, it's, it floods and most of the area floods. So this is this, it goes through this exchange every year and that maintains savanna, um, trees can't live in that sort of habitat. Um, I'm gonna give you uh, some of the species in the savanna area and most of this footage, and these are things that you can see as well, come from our Barbasso Nature Reserve, that's 27,000 acres. And I'll just go through some of the mammals and then birds. Um, so as this is a savanna habitat, you have a lot of species that are adapted in, in sort of it's an Amazon basin area. But these species are adapted to grasslands. This is a nine band armadillo. We have the yellow armadillo. This is a coati. These are from some of our camera traps that we have on our reserve now. So we've got some interesting footage here. And then uh, we have three species of deer. This is the pampas deer. We also have the gray deer. And this is a type of um, mutualism where these are um, grayish jays that are coming and uh, picking off probably ticks from the, the grayish uh, deer. We also have the marsh deer, which is a much larger deer and fairly rare because it's often sought out for hunting. That's, as you can see, the long legs adapted for savanna habitat. And then we have the maned wolf, which again is another species adapted for, for savanna habitat. That's a, a picture of it there. Another species that's purely savanna, the giant anteater, again in our, our camera trap spot, that uh, tends to do a route every day, visiting the different uh, anthills. And then, and then as we're protecting that area, we're seeing a lot of predators come back. So this is the ocelot. There's a young ocelot behind it. And we're also seeing our population of pumas increase quite a bit now. And that's, it's just part of, we bought their area, we got rid of cattle, and now that the whole area is sort of recuperating. And uh, this guy did pose for us, which was very nice of him. Um, there are jaguars on the reserve, but none of them have stayed right now. They're just passing through. But so the whole area has jaguars as a species. And then birds, savanna adapted birds, the greater rhea, um, really, you know, almost looking like an ostrich in the same family group, um, but to a savanna habitat. The, the Beni savannas receive a lot of the um, um, water species from Argentina in a sort of reverse uh, austral migration. So in Argentina's winter, which is now ending, we're going into spring. Um, a lot of these birds come up and spend and sort of congregate in the in the savannas. 
Also, um, a lot of, we also are working on protecting a lot of these tall grass, small birds that are threatened because, because most of the grass is cut for cattle and burnt. So you get a lot of these sort of um, smaller species that need tall grass that are, that are populations are, are suffering. Cocktail tyrant, that was a black mass finch. Cocktail tyrant here. Uh, streamer tail tyrant. And then you also have uh, just birds that are adapted. So the toko toucan, and this species is adapted to savannas, just edge species and isolated uh, forest area. And that's the same situation with the blue-throated macaw. So there they are, blue-throated macaw. We estimate there's about 450 in the wild, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. Uh, the population definitely increased in the last 10 years. And that's partially from our efforts. Um, the species relies heavily on this motoku palm fruit. That's 80% uh, of its diet. Um, and it shares the area with the blue and yellow macaw. And I'm sure you, you're familiar with it, but you see the black line and the white skin around the bill opposed to the pink skin. But the birds um, do are often seen together, uh, perching together, they will roost together. So here you have blue and yellow on the left, blue-throated macaws on the right. You get an idea of the variation there. But the thing about it is the blue and yellow macaw is found in this area, and the blue-throated macaw is found only there in the world. So 450 birds uh, critically endangered, and uh, we are working to try to make sure the species is stable. Um, so if we take that area of the Beni Savannah, sort of smaller part, expand on it, these green um, globes, or which one I call it, are, are what we've found to be three sort of separate blue-throated macaw populations. So we call it the Western population. Then we have the Northern one to the right. Uh, high, high, I guess you can see my mouse there. No, I can do that. Um, so, so that would be the western population, that's the northern population, that's the southern population. And we have a reserve in, a, in a, the northern population, and then we have a reserve in the southern population. I'm going to sort of talk about that and what we've been doing there on our conservation efforts. So the, the southern one is the Laney Rickman uh, Nature Reserve. Okay, something just came up for chat. Okay. Um, so as a conservation project, what, as, as they should do, we had a, a species action plan, right? Where we put out all the priorities and what we want to be working on. And basically um, that is to do the, the best thorough conservation we can do. Um, what we're looking at are, first of all, what are the threats to the species? So for the blue-throated macaw, illegal pet trade was a threat. Another threat was killing of the bird um, for the headdresses. And this is the indigenous headdresses that, that, were, that they use in the, the savannah. Another threat to the species is the introduction of diseases, which, which was something, this is just an example of what happened in the US, but, but they can be an introduced disease can be devastating, and habitat destruction. So these are the main threats to the blue-throated macaw. When we started working on the project, we, we sort of looked at these four main, main threats. But you also have in, in a recuperation what they call limiting factors. And, and everything in nature basically has a limiting factor that, that what, is, what stops the population from growing larger. And the four sort of known limiting factors are food, predators or competitors, disease, and shortage of breeding sites. These are sort of the main uh, limiting factors. So if ever you're working at a species and looking how it's recuperating, you should try to look at these factors. So that's sort of, you make a plan where you, where you really are trying to um, unbiased, uh, objectively, what are the things that need to be done and, and what, and then and research, maybe some of these, what could be the main limiting factors that are not allowing the species to recuperate. And I'm saying all this because it's, it's, it's important that people understand. So if, if the main limiting factor is food resources, getting enough food or illegal trade, the response to that wouldn't be to the solution is not to captive breed and release birds. And, and that's something that you need to understand that every conservation bird and situation is different and, and, and people need to sort of have an idea of what are the limiting factors and what are the threats and then you're responding to those and you're not just uh, captive breeding. And I'll, I'll tell, talk about why I'm sort of bringing this up. But I want to stress that point because we, we are trying to be very objective. So our program um, 
when we first began, we worked, uh, the, it was clear that illegal trade was, was a, the biggest problem and we worked very hard on this. So these are older photos, um, but we had uh, macaws going through. It was sort of without any control whatsoever. This is red front of macaw. We had high macaws coming from Brazil coming in. And what, what we decided to do, and this is Marcelo Herrera, and he worked for the project, sorry, Mauricio Herrera, and he worked for the project for seven years. But he, his, his thing, he said, is that the people just need to know about this bird. They need to know that they, the Beni savannas have an endemic species. And if, if they know that, they'll want to protect it. And, and so basically for, and this was with Loro Parque's support, for about four years, the project was really, I mean, you know, here we had a big conservation project. We have biologists working on it. But the most important thing to do at that time was just let everyone know, let people in the Beni savannas know that this bird is, is threatened. So it, we did everything from posters, pamphlets, and this is him visiting ranches where there's no electricity, giving a, a demonstration on his laptop, um, educating children. Um, and, and then we got what we got from that, and this is sort of now old news, but this is, this is a, a, one of the examples, but a bus that travels where the person wrote on it, help me to live. And, and, and the message was clear that people want to protect the blue of macaw. And, and from that, we, we can basically say we brought illegal trade to zero. And um, we now have friends in the market, whatever. We haven't had birds sort of openly being sold now for about seven years. Um, occasionally you hear about a bird is showing up somewhere, maybe someone's raising or something, but um, the threat in the wild has really gone down. Um, the same thing with the, the killing of birds for the headdresses. This is a traditional um, ceremony. It's very, there's a lot of pride in it in the Beni area. It's something that we want to be careful with, but there are also high schools sort of making these headdresses with macaw feathers for parades and whatnot. So we just began a program, and this, this, this is about again, five years ago, where it, it was an alternative. And it basically uh, using a palm um, frond with cloth, these, they, the, they were shown how to make them these headdresses and then and then they could be replaced and um, you can see there it's it was kind of beautiful that these synthetic feathers ended up end, entering into the traditional culture of making the headdress so it's still something um, quite quite uh, artistic and and of their culture but but we've just got a new element and and this has been very successful um, really well received far more than we ever thought so this is a dance now by indigenous um, group and all of those headdresses are with alternative feathers and basically what we have is this sort of stat where um, you know in, in the city of Trinidad Santa Ana so 2012 all the headdresses that were being used and, and if you think of each headdress represent about 10 killed macaws not just blue throated macaws blue and yellow macaws and also red and green but um, we the in 2017 only four percent of the headdresses were used were actually still of feathers and the town of santa ana was only 11 percent the town of san ignacio we we didn't have funds to do it as much training and they're they are more um, interested in maintaining for the indigenous dances their macaw feathers and so for that um, we want to sort of bring back the program but this this group feathers for native americans is looking at collecting the tail feathers, just the tail feathers, macaw tail feathers. And I think we've got a goal of trying to reach like 300 tail feathers. There's going to be a bunch of problems with societies bringing it down, whatever, but we've got people who say once we get enough, we could bring them down and sort of bring them to that, those indigenous communities so that the authorized indigenous groups that are doing the dance would receive these, um, these tail feathers. So that's something you want to note if, if you're interested. There's the, the, the web page there. Um, some of this stuff, the links are put in the chat at the end as well. Uh, and the introduction of diseases is something that um, we're very concerned with. Uh, we are trying to be objective about this. Uh, there, it, it's, it's for an NGO, for a conservation group, it's a way to get a lot of attention releasing a bird in, in the wild. The, the, the whole idea, many, many of the people in the general public love that idea, but the problem exists and still exists that there are diseases that can't be completely tested for. And so you run the risk, especially with many parrots that have mixed with birds throughout the world, of introducing a disease into the population. And, and the question is, do, is that what needs to, be, needs to occur? 
And we just had a, a long discussion with London Zoo because they were thinking about sending down zoo, um, birds. The, the World Pear Trust is very interested in reint reintroducing um, captive birds into the wild, into Bolivia. And we don't believe that's necessary. We were trying to stop that from occurring. And we had a, a meeting with committees on that and they decided that it's, it isn't necessary. We're seeing the, the numbers of the birds increasing in the wild and we don't, why put this population at risk, even minimal risk, risk when, when, when the population is increasing, we know what we need to do to reduce minimum, uh, limiting factors so that it, this is not something that's needed. But again, you can see it, it can draw a lot of attention. And I think for some groups, they're also very interested in gaining that attention, probably that fundraising attention, opposed to what's the real priority for conservation. Um, so most of the Beni Savannas, grassland, uh, and so grassland is ideal for cattle. And so it's all private uh, cattle ranches, pretty much. There's no national park in the area. And that's a lot of habitat impact. Um, the cattle ranching, they burn the, the grasslands every year. There's also the problem of Africanized grasses where they will actually plow over savannas and, and plant a, a mono, monoculture of Africanized grass. This is a threat and something we need to be preparing for in the future. But part of that then is protecting habitat. And uh, this is, so we've, and as you've seen the map, we've made the Barbasso Reserve, the northern part, that southern part, and now we've purchased that. So now we're 27,000 acres of a protected area in, in the, for the Western population. What we've done, and I'll talk a bit about this, is, is to, uh, we, we need to pay for this conservation. And, and it's, it's sort of boring to donors to keep on asking to pay for park guards and gasoline and vehicles and what have you. So um, what we're looking at is um, how to make this reserve sustainable. And, and one of, and you can, this is sort of basically the design right here. We're hoping that ecotourism, definitely not this year, but ecotourism in the future will be something that will help make the reserve sustainable. But we also on the Eastern part are gonna do model ranches um, where it's a low impact. And what we're looking at is how it could be ranched without burning the grass and savannas and how it, what would be the best sort of head count to maintain the diversity in the area and, and, and yet the ranchers could still have cattle. So we're, we're, the plan is that this would be a ranch that when, we, when it gets productive, we can bring in other ranchers and show them uh, methods to maintain their natural habitat and still have the cattle. And one big example, oh, I'll show you, I'll come up to it. So, but the na nature reserve, because they burn every year, this is a, a real program and, and we've got our fire breaks up this year. So everything's fine. We haven't had a fire in the reserve now for four years. So there's always a threat of fire coming in. So we have to cover these elements. Um, these, these are covering the savanna, but the fires can get to the, the forest islands. Also the reserve, we're looking at these are these small um, roosting islands and potentially breeding islands. And so protecting these, and you can see like that island 12B, the cattle have pretty much wiped out in the history, uh, the, 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 the trees in the area. And so now we need to reforest that one and bring it back. And that, that is sort of part of the, what this ranching does. Um, if you see the, this sort of forest island, you, these are all older trees, maybe 50 years old, but there's no regeneration. And, and so really, I mean, a lot of the ranchers, even ranchers want these forests to, for shade and, and protection from storms in the area. But if, that, if that's left to continue for the next 80 years, they, the Beni Sabans will lose 90% of the forests in the forest islands, which is the food resource, Mota Kupam, of the Mekong. So it's something we're, we're working on heavily. Um, we've been reforesting these forest islands. One of the, one of the things we discovered that, that, that the problem isn't so much the seeds in the area, it's that the soil is so compacted that seeds can't germinate. And so the first thing to do to go in there is just dig and dig and dig and, and loosen up all the soil. Um, we had a program visiting all the, our neighboring ranchers and telling them what we're doing. And um, this, this was an example of a ranch where we told them about what's going on, what we're protecting, and then they decided this is their tractor and they made a fire break on their reserve that would go beside ours, so that was good. And then some other sort of long-term savanna stuff that when you're, when you're doing fire breaks, you actually don't want that all the savanna is the same age. And so this is what they call patch burning and a way of managing for savanna. So you get a mosaic of savanna areas. And what we need to look at in, in North America, you tend to look at um, first year, second year, and third year growth. But maybe in Bolivia, it could be five years of growth. And so maybe doing patch burns where, where we have um, tall grass beside three-year grass beside recently burnt. And there's also some 
uh, at birds and mammal species that that like to breed in the tall grass, but then forage in the in the in the very short area recently burnt. So you want to have that mix. Um, and so the Barabas Soil Nature Reserve has the highest concentration of blue throated macaws in the world. What what we get is the birds uh, basically wintering in the reserve. So they start arriving around uh, May. Well, they start arriving earlier, but, but May there's large amounts. And then by October, they tend to leave and they go breeding. And we've been, these are our counts of the birds that we've been doing. Um, I, I mean, uh, it's looking pretty good. We were seeing young uh, adults arriving with young birds every year. And the population appears to be increasing. This is at a roosting site. We'll, we're, gonna, we're organizing a count, a count this uh, September again. We'll see what numbers we get, but uh, it's uh, it certainly there's no signs that the population is decreasing. And and so as as this is such an amazing place, and the, and the mammals are so tame, we part of what we want to do is is bring get get tourism going there. We have horseback riding in the area. We have uh, trails through the Cerrado habitat, which is sort of savanna tree savanna. We've uh, We've gotten a dining facility built in the area now, so that's available um, for uh, guests. And this is this is sort of our our ranch base. On the left is our uh, as one of the cabins. Um, there's the inside the dining facility, and we have four cabins that look out into the the marsh and are in the forest. So you're sort of in in the forest in in these cabins. And we luckily we got uh, support last year that we could make. Normally these ranches, because they're so isolated, you have a, a generator you have to turn on, it sort of runs all through the night or whatever. And now we're completely solar run. So we have lights throughout the day. And, and uh, this, is, this is one of our goals. I have a proposal I have to try to get us an electric four by four. I'll see if that can happen one of these days. Um, let me show you that. So I'll, I'll, I have some of the web pages if you want to look into that. Um, well, I'm going to be guiding a parrot tour next year in Bolivia if everything goes okay. <laughs> we'll see, uh, maybe February. But um, we've we've Bird Bolivia, that's uh, a tourism agency. My wife and I run just for, uh, for sort of a cottage, uh, few bird tours we do a year and some of the other trips. Um, we did one, um, we had 28 parrot species, nine macaw species, 13 parakeets, six parrots. That was a 17 day trip. So probably uh, put together something like that. I know there's some people who are interested. I'll give you my um, email and if you're interested, uh, you can let me know. And I'll give you, you know, figure out what it costs and with, when, when it could run. Probably would run in June next year. Um, but. Uh, I, I, my plan, and every, everyone talks about Tambopata in Peru and the best place to go. I think Bolivia is far better. I think we got more macaws and tamer macaws and parrots, but uh, that's my goal for like the next 10 years. 
and, and just uh, as so as I was talking about, this is how we pay for this stuff now, but but uh, that we're we're always trying to figure out how to be sustainable because um, you don't you want you know you don't want to have to every year not know where the funding is going to come from. So this this is sort of our sustainable goal. We're hoping that that about a quarter comes from tourism. Um, well, but we have less. I don't know what that is. Forty percent, thirty-five percent is cattle. Um, we've got a group called Friends of Barbasul. These are our people, individuals who give ten thousand dollars a year to support the reserve. Um, and that's become quite a. They're sort of more involved in the management, um, and then Keepers of the Wild and other groups. So this is what we're sort of looking in the future. So so now we're at Barbasul. Now we're going to go down to Laney Rickman Reserve. And that's down in this part. This is sort of a more wooded area. We have uh, 1,682 acres reserved there. And this is where we had a breeding program um, for many years. We call it Laney Rickman, named after Laney Rickman, who um, from Texas, she was very involved in help supporting our nest box program. And she, she was the one who came up with the idea of the needle adoptivo, really helped um, bring the blue throat macaw conservation efforts to North America. Um, and she unfortunately passed away two years ago, so we decided to name the reserve after her. There's there's a reserve. Um, they, again, the same. It's more forested. These are our fire breaks. These are smaller fire breaks, but we have a, a, a ATV vehicle so that uh, we can get to a fire and, with water. And then, so when something that that was really you know a learning lesson for us but when they say habitat destruction you sort of think about cutting down the forests or fires or what have you but there's another sort of quieter um, element which is just um, people living with forests but using here you know this is a typical uh, oven that's used in the Benny but it's a it's a, a wood wood run oven and and basically the wood materials for fence and whatever is taking large trees out of the habitat and so many times you have an area and it looks fairly natural, but you've actually over a hundred years, all the big hardwood trees, all the large trees have been removed. And what we did was we put up nest boxes um, to, to basically it was an experiment. We're gonna put up 20 nest boxes in an area where there's lots of trees and just see what happens. Um, and I'm just curious really in this, in this area. So we, we copied a, a nest that, that worked, uh, a, a blue throat macaw, so fledged from it. So we sort of looked at the same size, we looked at the same hole, and we put that up. And so we put up these nest boxes, and we had a black belly whistling duck in the nest box. And this is the first year, it's like, what was it? 2005, that's right. So we had white-eyed parakeets in, the, in a nesting box. Um, we had blue and yellow macaws in the nesting box. We had a muscovy duck in a nesting box. We had two chestnut fronted macaws in the nesting box. We had a laughing falcon in the box honeybees and just one, but we also had a pair of blue-throated macaws. And so right away, it sent two messages. One, that there's a real need for nesting cavities, that, that there's, it's actually, even though there's lots of forest, that impact has been quite heavy, and that blue-throated macaws could, could be, that might be a limiting factor for blue-throated macaws when they're re recuperating. And this pair raised one individual that fledged. Um, the next year, we had We had three nest boxes fledged four blue throat macaws. And uh, we've also had barn owls, uh, uh, laughing falcon, toco toucans, opossums, uh, uh, arboreal uh, anteaters. Um, so the program, the program we, we're, we basically the blue line is looking at the number of nest boxes used. So the blue line is our blue through macaws using nest boxes and the yellow line are blue and yellow. So this was successful, but it needed some improving. I mean, to be working on it. Um, basically, as I said, we were following that design with this, this big hole with the blue and yellow macaws and they loved our nest boxes. And some, be we, some people said, well, it seems like you're doing more of a blue and yellow conservation project than a blue throated macaw conservation project. We had uh, blue throated macaws take to a nest box and we come back a week earlier, a week later, and blue and yellows had taken over. And we found that blue and yellows were more aggressive and that they would remove blue through the macaws from the nest box. So we started experimenting with the nesting hole and the boxes looking, first we thought it was too big, blue through macaws smaller than the blue and yellow macaw. So we started reducing the hole, 
but but we also couldn't just you know take it and reduce it to you know we get this funding by supporters every year to support this project if we just went down to a really small one and we had no blue through macaws it would have been a failure and people lost hope in it. So we do like every year we were doing a little smaller, a little smaller hole, you know, just to see what's going on. And we were seeing what we wanted, where we kept on seeing blue through the macaws using the boxes and less and less blue and yellow macaws. Then we put a harder wood in the front because we found the blue through macaws really like to chew, but not so much blue and yellow macaws. So blue through macaws don't have a problem chewing a bit bigger and, or wing, wing uh, slits to get in. And basically we got it down to this by 2015. Um, base got the blue and yellows out of the boxes and, the, and you can see the blue through the macaws more and more. And that, that was what we were, a 10 centimeter hole. That seems to work very well. Um, and that's, yes, yeah, so but then again, uh, blue, again, you can see that 2018, we had more blue through the macaws using nets. And that's this year's, that's with this year's data. So um, we had last year a little uh, problem because we had an intelligent pair of blue and yellow macaws that, that we have a little door to go in to check the chicks and they ripped that apart and we were using the nest box as a whole. So we've had to do reinforced doors to our nest boxes to keep the blue and yellows out. They're smart birds, these macaws. So that's, that's um, this, this year we had um, 12 chicks. You can see that, uh, that, that we call it breeding attempts now because this year we actually had blue through macaws that tried to breed in a box it failed, the eggs failed, and then another pair or maybe the same pair tried again. So, so uh, we had that twice. So, so now we call, we're calling it nesting attempts, but we had 12. Um, and basically you can see that this is what, what blue through macaws will do with nest, nesting boxes, chew them up like crazy, make them theirs. Um, this is, these are some uh, blue through macaw bred nesting boxes. Uh, and you can see the, they, they like to take that round hole and then make, make a little slit to come in and out. Um, I'll put, uh, if you haven't seen it, I'll put in the, in the chat, there's a link to a video we made of the breeding of the, in the nest boxes this year using nest cams. It's, it's kind of a fun video. Oh, I went to one head. Um, and this, these are our results for this year. So again, um, looking good. Uh, what you see is the yellow line or orangey line are the fledglings, the fledglings, uh, birds that have chicks that have fledged from the nest box. So we've had the, the most 12 last year and this year, the same amount. And then the blue line are the number of attempts, which is again increasing. We're also seeing um, this year we had three pairs with rings. So we're seeing birds that, that fledged from the nest box and then have now come back to breed. And, and as you guys I'm sure know, often the first years of young breeders, are, they're not successful. So, so all it indicates that this is just gonna continue to improve. Um, you can see that these are, these are, this is a pair that bred um, and they have rings, so they came from the nesting box. And then just talking about all that, this is for the Laney Rickman Reserve. These are, this, is, this is what it costs. It costs us about $40,000 a year just to keep it going. Um, this is also our nest box program, um, but, but I mean, these aren't, aren't ridiculous expenses. This is just the sort of the reality. And, and then I was, this is, this is sort of a, where we'd like the Laney Rickman Reserve to go in the long run. Um, and we're sort of looking at, you know, I, ideally all of this would be best for like fire equipment, is like, you know, necessary for protection, fence repair, things like that. Um, and something I'll just mention, so uh, I went last year to, to the reserve and my goal was to film blue through macaws feeding chicks. And so I, I timed it just perfectly so I would arrive right at the end. But I arrived when, and we sort of learned, I learned a lesson here, the blue through macaws, when the chicks are just about ready to fledge, they stop feeding them. And they're basically sort of doing this hard love where, where they're just hanging around. They're not going near the chicks and they're just hanging around waiting and encouraging the chicks to fledge. So all I had were these birds hanging upside down, calling on occasion, but never going to the nest. But um, what I want to say, we, we also, with the Lenny Rickman Reserve, we created a Rickman Fund. And so far we've raised $230,000 that American Bird Conservancy is holding and investing. And so the interest of that helps, um, it gives us around $12,000 a year right now. And so that's, that's a quarter of the cost of the reserve management. And that's something some um, one person has left that as a bequest for us. So I don't know the exact amount, but that's something that, 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 that exists, that will always exist and it will always take care of the reserve. So just, I'll give you the link. That's through ABC Protect, um, 
you know, taking care of that fund. Um, and, and so great success with the nest box program. And, you know, here they are, they're pretty low to the ground. Those are fine. They work great. But what we, in the Barbasol Nature Reserve, we threw up nest boxes and we didn't have a single bird breeding the boxes at all. And we went seven years and we kept on changing them in those, these little small forest islands. We put them there and we thought that, you know, it needed to be away from a big area, safer, and they, they roost there. The birds never took to them. And then Charlie Borsma, who's been managing the Bluefield Macaw Project um, for the last four years, went to find where they bred because the birds leave the reserve and breed and then come back every year. And that palm tree, that palm tree with no fronds on the top was where he found a blue throated macaw nest. You can see it there. So what we decided um, was to put together a proposal to make these penthouse nest boxes. Um, and and uh, we put up four and we put these up last, so we put these up, this is 2018, but the birds um, didn't come to breed until 2019. And we right away had blue throated macaws on top of the nest box. So this is the first time we've ever gotten blue-footed macaws to be on top of the nest box in the Barbasol Nature Reserve. So basically, you've got these different populations. You've got intelligent, smart birds that have different cultures. And so the breeding culture of these birds is different from the breeding culture of the, the smaller birds. Um, I went out there to film the blue-footed macaws um, on the nest box, and I had an Orinoco goose in the box. And you can see that the macaws open the top end to it. Um, and then in August, we had a weird electrical storm and, and a, a, a lightning bolt hit the boxes and blew two of the boxes away. So they, these were boxes that the, the birds were keen on, they were chewing on, um, but uh, they were destroyed. The other three, bar, the other, no, sorry, it blew one box away and the other three had um, bees had taken to it, which is, which is often a problem in the Nextbox program, but, but we hadn't had in the lower part, but we did have in the southern. And we came back in September, and here you had the blue through macaws perched on what was a nest box, but the hole. So we, we, this is our uh, raising of the nest box. We're putting eight more up. We're going to have open holes. Um, we're going to, sorry, we have eight up now. We're going to put another 10 nest boxes up, penthouse nest box up. We're going to do 10, we're going to do five, just like the ones that we found where they're an open hole. And then, and then we're putting up uh, the others with this hole. Um, right now, from news from the field, there's one blue and yellow macaw in the box, which, which is okay, because maybe if they take to it, maybe the blue throats will take to it next year. They'll sort of learn. There's a pair, um, there's three boxes with bees. There's a pair of blue throated macaws perching on a box. They seem to like it. They don't breed until November, so may, hopefully they'll stick around. And we've got three empty ones. So it's, we're really, you know, going to keep on tweaking this and playing with this like we did with Lenny Rickman to find out what the blue throated macaws want. And just so if you're curious about how you might want to help the, our blue throated macaw endeavors, um, one option is to adopt the nest box. And I can put the link in the chat there. So that, that, that program, $250, adopts a nest box for a year. And we, we sort of name, we put your initials on the box. We tell you where your box is and, and then whether you get blue throated macaws in them or, or not. People used to get blue and yellows, but we don't, we don't do that anymore. Um, we also have a group called Friends of Laney Mickman Reserve, which are, are a group of people who donate $2,000 a year to the reserve. And they're more like the Barbot School, they're more involved in the management um, ideas, just helping out, really. We talk about things, sometimes good ideas. They, they review the budget. Um, so there's that option. Um, that's the, and I'll, again, that's, so you, that can be done. ABC holds a page for us. And that's it, abcbirds.org, or donate Armonia. Those funds go to us. And also there is the Laney Rickman Reserve Fund, as I mentioned, which is something forever, per perpetuity. Um, some people are leaving as a, a bequest. Uh, that, that right now is at 230,000, and we're just, that will be there forever, building up and hopefully paying for the reserve. And all of this wouldn't be possible without so many groups that continue to support us. Um, faithful donors, ICF from Canada, uh, World Land Trust has helped us purchase reserves, pays for our park guards. American Bird Conservancy has been fantastic supporting land purchase and reserve protection. Um, so we have our group, Friends of Barbasul. The, the, we also are protecting Savannah Habitat for the Buff Breasted Sandpiper. And so Amer uh, Neotropical, the US Fish and Wildlife Service supports the project through the Neotropical Migratory Bird Conservation Act. Uh, Rainforest Trust 
supported the purchase of the land and we're looking at supporting more work at uh, Lenny Rickman with nest boxes, March Conservation Fund, IUC in Netherlands, Bird Bolivia, Bird Endowment, Cincinnati Zoo support us last year and the Mohammed bin Zayed. Okay, and so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. And I'll copy the link in the text. Um, so now it's, we can go to questions if there are questions. Wow. Uh, what's the next step? Oh, thank you so much, Ben. This was terrific. Uh, gosh, I have so many questions. <laughs> okay. I'm sure other people do too. Oh, first, I just want to mention, is the video supposed to be choppy like that, or is it a, are, the, are those oh. like sequential uh, photos? No, it's not supposed to be choppy, <laughs> because it's a Zoom thing or something. Uh, that's interesting. Learn, learn, learn. So the, all the videos were choppy? Yes. Yeah, they were oh, like okay. sequential photos. I, I wasn't sure if you were aware or not. Uh, no, I, I look at a perfectly running video, but all right, okay. live and learn. Okay. Okay, so Susie says, does the World Carrot Trust help? So should I, hold on, should I turn off the, I'll turn off this slideshow. Yes, and, you can do that and then we can go back to a different view here. And I'm still sharing the screen, I'll stop sharing. Ah, okay, there we go. Just me, okay. And there, go back to gallery view there. Okay, so does World Carrot Trust help? Oh, um, hi. Frankie and Poo Poo. So, so World Paratrust has their own program. Um, um, uh, we, I, I have to be frank here. I don't agree with their um, methods of parrot conservation. So, for a long time, they were they had a program where they would find uh, nests and then force feed chicks and remove parasites. And you'll see my video. Um, we don't do any of that, and Donald Brightsmith has shown us some of the science that shows that the more you visit nest boxes, the, 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 the less the reproductive success is. Um, we, um, for example, all the nest boxes we had this year, um, it, it seems like the egg stage is a really vulnerable stage. So, so and, and it also seems like pa parents don't always protect eggs, or not, they're not going to invest as much. So if something goes wrong with eggs, they just leave it. But, but it, all, all the chicks that, that hatch from eggs, all of them fledge the wild without us having to do anything. And, and so that we've had conflicts. And we also don't, don't agree that we need to bring down um, pet birds that have, been, that have potential diseases and introduce them into the wild. We don't see that as a, a rational uh, conservation action. So they do, they have their own project and you can look, they, they, they um, are trying to convince zoos to bring down birds to release in the wild. Um, I don't understand, I don't think it's very scientific what they're doing, but I think, honestly, I think it's to raise money and it will get a lot of attention. Here, I'm gonna just put the links in here. Let me see if that works, paste. Yeah, okay. So in the chat there, you, I've got the links to uh, some of the things I mentioned, also to the nest box video, okay. Thank you. No problem. Are other people seeing links? I can. Yeah. Why am I not? Oh, in a Zoom group chat. Yep. Yeah, are you posting to everyone? Oh, oh. It what went. I think you post, maybe you posted to uh, Susan. Oh, that's true. Wow, I didn't even know that was a thing. Why? Okay, oh, yeah, let me yeah. Let me try it again. <laughs> there. Oh, there we go. Perfect. I'll okay. try that out too. So um, you, you mentioned bees, and I know bees are a big issue with, with nest box everywhere. Are there mm -hmm. any, uh, is there anything you can do about that to discourage bees from entering nest box? Sure. Um, um, and we'll experiment with that. Look, with, with our nest boxes in Loreto area, the southern part, they were only in about 10% of the nest boxes, and often less. So it really was never enough that we needed to do any of these measures. Um, but there's one where there's a type of plastic that you can coat the roof of the nest box with. The problem is macaws like to chew on everything. And, and the question has been, are we gonna be putting in plastic and the macaws gonna be chewing it and, and swallowing it or giving it to their chicks? Um, there are also pesticides that are supposedly uh, not harmful, but will discourage bees. We, um, 
that might be one of the reasons why macaws like the open roofed um, um, uh, holes of, of trunks, that the, the bees don't tend to go in those. So we are gonna put in some of those. I mean, the barbasol natures of those, we have had more boxes with bees and, and we'll, so we'll just do it year by year and, and see, you know, if they take that, I, I think macaws would prefer a roof, a nice closed cavity, but maybe this is a, a, a compromise they had to make in the wild because closed cavities are more with bees. Um, um, we'll, we'll look into this, but, uh, but there, are, there are things that can be done. Again, if it's only 10%, I think that's fine. Bees are part of the ecosystem, you know, that I can. Well, do bees tend to go in their natural cavities also, the natural nesting cavities? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, okay, so yeah. this, they're used to this problem. Now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And also, I want to know: uh, Is there any uh, crossbreeding between the blue and golds and the blue-throated macaws? Zero. Zero. And there's, there's. It's really interesting because when you're in the field, there, there really are different birds. Um, and a lot of uh, pet owners have told me that, like the blue-throated macaws, the chewing and what have you. But basically, they they'll roost together in a safe place where the blue throats will the blue throats will all roost together, but then blue and yellows will roost around them. And there's, there's about 360 pairs or or blue throat sorry 360 blue and yellow macaws in the reserve at the height. So they're everywhere in the roosting area in those little islands. But um, the behavior is very different. The blue and yellow macaws tend to fly up to the gallery forests, which are more like Amazonian forests, whereas the blue they both go and eat multicupa. So they'll fly out of their roost, they go and eat the palm trees for the morning breakfast from like six to eight. And then the blue and yellows go off to the gallery forest and they're looking like at Amazonian tree species fruits. Whereas the blue throated tend to go around the cerrado, the grassland isolated trees. And I, and I get the sense they're far more adapted again in a chewing, manipulating. I mean, you saw that video I had up there. They, they'll go through leaf buds and eat, eat things like that. And so when I'm in those those lower tree areas, I never have blue and yellow macaws, but I do have blue throat. But but as far as breeding and social, I mean, I mean the cat, the song, the vocalizations are worlds apart, um, and they they wouldn't confuse each other. And you don't get a situation things like the black duck and the mallard, where where the black ducks are the females are attracted to mallard males. You don't get a situation like that where where they like their own species and they're they're fine that way. Cool. Okay, Lily asks, do you have a sense of whether the blue and yellow macaws have expanded their range to overlap with the area of blue-throated endemism, or have they always overlapped? This sounds like a Sam question, not a Lily question. I had a uh, little debate about that uh, with a friend of mine. Um, I think, and we don't know this, um, we know they're different species. I, what I think, my theory is, and I'm hoping one day we can prove it, uh, clearly, clearly there, there was there's sister species, clearly. I mean, they look very similar. There, something occurred that separated them um, and then brought them back together. Well, what I think that was, was that the Beni savannas, the blue-throated macaws, so the blue and yellows that live in the Beni savannas, eventually evolved to become blue-throated macaws. And they are far more adapted to the savanna habitat. And I believe that indigenous people, when humans came to the, the New World 10,000 years ago, or maybe 14,000 years ago, um, there's a lot about um, them gardening forests. And one of the, one of the things that I, I believe they brought in was the Mota Kupam. And so they brought in, because people use the oil as shampoo and for cooking and everything. It's, it, I mean, in, indigenous people, it's a, it's a strong part of that, that culture. And I actually had a video I did in Barbasul about it, but, it, but it's amazing because the palm fruit is oil. So it's not sugar, it's oil. And oil is, is high calories. So it's a really good food. And so I believe that the people came in, brought in the palm fruits, and that opened the area up for blue and yellow macaws. And again, it is 80% of their diet. So it's, it's really, you know, if you got rid of the, blue, the motaku palm fruit, maybe the blue throats would stick around, but I bet you the blue and yellows would, would have a tough time keeping going. So that's my theory, but it needs to be shown. Um, there's a person who's done a study and they found um, kasa, uh, squash, uh, manioc, uh, uh, yucca, cassava, and in Barbasul Reserve 10,000 years ago. So people had come in and were bringing in these crops. Uh, I think, it's, of course, they were bringing in good palm fruit as well. That just makes sense, as well as other fruits. 
but remains to be proven. Yeah. Now, I know this is, this is in your area, and you may know nothing about this, but we've, of course, all heard about this huge fire in the Pantanal burning 10% of the habitat. And we're just wondering if that's affecting the hyacinth macaws. Um, um, from what I've heard, yes, but, but also um, um, they, they are capable of flying out. So, so um, the, you know, they, they don't, they're not stuck. They can fly to other areas. They're, the Pantanal, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's overstated. The fires in the Pantanal and the Benny Savannas are a yearly thing. Um, um, there, it's, it's never, um, it, it's, I don't know, there are drier seasons where it's worse. It can affect large trees and fruiting trees. Um, I think what you might see is a limit, a limiting habitat for hyacinth macaw, but um, hyacinth macaw has also been recuperating really well, like the last 15 years. Um, numbers really increasing. It's, it's been a, an excellent, uh, successful conservation job, again, using nest boxes because of the big, this is a massive macaw, and amazing to see in the wild. Um, you know, needing needing these these cavities. Um, uh, I think I think with conservation efforts, if they make sure food availability is there and there's nesting habitat, it, it's not it's it will be okay. I don't think uh, yeah. it'll probably affect more the longer term sort of thing. You know. Now, do the red fronted macaws interact with the blue throats at all, or are, are they even in the same? Uh, habitat or totally different? Red, red fur macaws are much more of a forest species. So oh, the blue okay. and yellows don't mind perching out in a tree in the middle of the nowhere. Red fur macaws, they'll perch on the, they'll perch, perch on the top of a canopy, but they really like a closed sort of Amazonian forest. They'll fly across rivers and they'll do what they call commuter flight where they're, you know, uh, a mile high flying to a, a new destination, but the, it's really not, not their habitat. So we see them on occasion, but the forest just don't offer them, I think they're just adapted to Amazonian forest fruits, so they, they would rather be in the Amazon forest kind of thing. Mm, okay. Well, I don't want to hug all the questions. If other people have some questions, you can either type in the chat or unmute yourself and yeah, say something. Okay. None of our um, McCall people? I, I, I had a question um, about the, um, the, the headdresses. Um, mm -hmm. And everything is that a, so is that going to be a continued area of focus um, for you with the different communities like you mentioned with um, some of them you've achieved a lot of success and some of them are still working on so do you see that as being a long term sort of relationship um, there that will be ongoing like an area of focus for you. Uh, 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 yes, no, yes, um, we need to do more. Um, the, the answer is clear that um, when we first did the project, they made extra um, feathers and they were, they were selling them. And, and I had a lot, and I actually brought them up to the US and I had people purchase the headdresses and they're, they're beautiful. And it was, it was all of a sudden something that they were um, embarrassed about because of the, the killing of the macaws to with alternative feathers is actually a form of, of an economic form. So, so it was a real win-win. Um, the problem was, and I guess we can take a little bit of blame for that, that uh, we don't know about business and business management. We were t talking about alternative feathers and whatever. And, and the problem is that it, the, you can sell the headdresses for $100. And these are, again, for, these are poor people, indigenous groups. That, so $100 is a lot of money. But it requires about $50 of materials to, to build to make them. And, and so you need a model, a business model, where you're selling them, and then you have, uh, you know, an, a, an organization that reinvests the funds. And, and that, we didn't realize it was going to be so successful that it was, that people were really keen to purchase them. We had a, we had a high school purchase like 30 um, uh, headdresses for $100 each. So it, it really has, so um, that's actually a proposal we've put out um, to basically hire a business person to come in and just to have a follow-up and to set up sort of a, a, a group that would manage the, the sales of the headdresses with reinvestment funds for, for the indigenous groups of the area. Um, and, and then ideally, if that really works, 
then in four years, it's, it runs on its own. And they, there's a bit of profit coming in and uh, it's, it's they're beautiful. I, I, something. So yes, we will try to continue this. Um, we, we just need some, well, some support and looking at uh, business professionals who, who know that kind of model and to do. You, you actually brought one to the club when you visited yeah, you in person. It was, it was gorgeous, absolutely enormous. And uh, it, was, yeah. it was really stunning. Yeah. It was yeah. stunning. So you met, you showed three communities, but I assume there are probably a lot of communities that well, have yeah, the, just the, in that one area. Well, the three, you tend to have um, the big uh, fe festival and, they, and the, the smaller communities all come to one spot and do the dancing oh. in that festival area. So. But everybody uh, has to have their own, it looks like. Yeah. I mean, you, you, could, you could, if people were capturing blue-throated macaws and pulling them, these headdresses, you could just wipe out the entire population in one, one fell swoop. Um, we like 450 birds, that's it. You just kill all yeah. the birds to the headdresses and they'd be gone, so. Yeah, well, and it's actually very interesting because you go to the roosting sites of the macaws and, and they'll fly off their roosting site at midnight if you walk up to it. So they're still very careful with humans. They don't like anybody being around them at all. Yeah, well, we can't blame them. We, we see peaches, the blue-throated macaw in, the, in Barbara's window wandering around. There we go. <laughs> hey, we're talking about you, peaches. <laughs> he's, not, he's not impressed. <laughs> uh, do, we, do we have some more, any more questions? Or? Uh, I'm also a U of T alum, so. Oh. Hey. <laughs> you know, maybe you could even get, you know, I don't know if there's a business person that would volunteer to do this. Maybe somebody's retired or something, so you, you wouldn't have to spend all that money hiring them. Yeah. Well, um, I think what, it, what, it, what, what I've noticed, I've seen um, these kind of initiatives in the past. And, and it's often, um, it's not that it's that hard to do, it just requires follow-up because it's almost as, as, as if uh, you're, 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 it's, a, it's a new philosophy, like cultural way of doing things. And, and it just needs every year, you know, do it again, what went wrong, what things need to be changed. Um, it certainly can, can occur. This is often, like I've seen ecotourism projects that are, they're great, they're wonderful, but they just do training for a year and then leave. And, and that's not enough to make something sustainable, right. you know? So that's- And this, that's wasn't even, this wasn't even designed to be a business, right? This was designed oh, yeah. for the local people that have headdresses, but this could turn out to be a, a significant source of income. Yeah, and, and some, exactly. And, 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 and I mean, wow, we could, you know, it's, it's again, win-win. I mean, here you've got a traditional cultural practice that it could be really valued and was, and, and they could make some money from it. I mean, that's- that's fantastic. And, and so I, I really feel we really need to try to get this together. It, it, to be it, with, with donors and, you know, I can, I can raise money for nest boxes far easier than I can raise money to set a business model for, and it's kind of stepping out of our range. I mean, I, I know about bird conservation. I don't, I'm not an expert on setting up micro business in an indigenous community, you know, so. Right. Yeah. Right. Sounds like, it sounds like a great project though. So, mm. uh, and um, I will I'll also send these links out to everybody through email, you know, encourage mm -hmm. anybody who would like to, to donate to this. You can, you can have a nest box. I, I know it's nest box there with my initials, but that wasn't me, but <laughs> I said, <started, laughs> oh, that could be my nest box. Ah. Uh, and the, the club will also, will also donate uh, to Armenia too. So uh, we're, we're happy to support this great cause. And do we, do we have any more questions? Um, I've got a comment. I want mm -hmm. to thank you for thank bringing you. up the problems with people trying to bring birds in from another area. Yeah. Because I actually got a call a week ago from a woman who heard that macaws were in trouble in the wild. So she wanted a macaw from me so she could breed it and give it to zoos and help solve the problem. Mm. And her heart was in the right place, but we had yeah. quite a long talk about how she couldn't do this and it wasn't a good idea. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, the, the, this is one of the big arguments that the, the breeders always bring up. You know, we have to breed because otherwise the birds will go extinct in the wild and we need birds to replenish them. 
which again makes no sense because if you're breeding for the pet trade, those birds can never go in the wild. Mm -hmm. And other than a few very, very specialized conservation breeding programs, there's just total disconnect. There's, there's no connection be between birds that are bred to be pets. And people even say, well, once we kill all the ones in the wild, we can put some in zoos. And of course, that's just like the, one of the saddest things in the world. I mean, of course, in uh, Cincinnati, that's where the last, at the, the Cincinnati Zoo, that's where the last passenger pigeon died. And <laughs> Sam's from, from Cincinnati. The last passenger pigeon and the, um, um, uh, what's it called? <laughs> you're, you're mute. Um, Carolina parakeet. Carolina yeah. parakeet, right, right. And when I went to Cincinnati last year, I actually saw the the very, very sad enclosure where both of them actually died one after another. So um, this, you know, if you see breeding people say that, it's just, it's apples and oranges. It's totally nonsensical. I mean, they're even doing this program now with the Spixes macaws, and they've moved a bunch of them back to Brazil. And, you know, I... I have reservations about that. One of which, of course, is if they release them, you're going to get criminals that are going to go and just kill the ones they're released to, for somebody to eat or to put in there or take them to their private collection. But, um, and do those birds even know how to survive? So, uh, let's see. Oh, the red back. Ah, microloans with Kiva for a business model. Uh, Oh, nonsense with the German zoo. That's what we're, yes, the ACPP <laughs> zoo. Yeah. Yes, zoo in quotes because there's, we don't know what's going on there. It's supposedly public, but yet they don't release any information. And then Australia sent them birds that were never supposed to leave the country. And they took all the Spixis macaws from Alhambra uh, when they shut down. So they have most of the Spixis in the world and they won't tell anybody what's going on or what, for all we know, they may have eaten the birds. So we, we don't know or given them to private collectors because they, you know, it should be considered a worldwide resource. They shouldn't be considered private property, but I guess they did send some to Brazil, but not really sure what's going on there either. So, so interesting take on, on all this. Yeah, microloans. Uh, yeah, you know, I support Kiva um, all the time. It's probably one of the very few non-animal um, organizations I support. These, so for those of you who don't know, they have these $25 microloans and they go all around the world uh, to help people who need small amounts of money. And um, it really, you know, they might need $500 or something to be able to open up a store. So all these little tiny microloans that people who would never be able to get actual loans from the bank or enough of them to get a business going or to, to do small projects and stuff. So it's, it's, and then they have to pay it back. There's a schedule they pay back and then you can reloan the money out. So it's, it's a really very, very worthwhile organization if you wanna help poor people around the world get a leg up and, and, and try to move out of their poverty and onto to other things, so, okay. Any more comments or questions? If not, I, I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank Janet especially. Marianne has a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go I, ahead, I, Marianne. I didn't know I was on. I was looking to see if I was on here. Sorry about that. Um, no I have one question um, about the babies. Uh, mm -hmm. Then you had mentioned that they, um, well, get the babies to fledge from the, the nests as, as soon as they can. And I, I was curious, do the blue-throated and the blue and gold, are they the same in that regard? And are other macaws in the wild, are they the same or are they, they different? Do, do they treat the babies differently as far as feeding them and encouraging them to leave? I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, um, we, we haven't ever had sort of someone who's been able to sit and watch all this. We, we put up camera traps. We bought some camera traps um, and kind of, we got them late in the year, and we 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 thought, well, let's just put them up and see what happens. Uh, they worked really well, um, and and it all of a sudden made some discoveries. Um, what I suspect is that you might you get uh, 
especially with macaws, intelligent birds, so you actually get pairs with different cultures. So maybe this hanging upside down, encouraging, maybe other ones won't do that. Uh, we don't have that for blue and yellow macaws. Uh, Cesar, our parabiologo, who's been doing most of this work, he, he wasn't really aware that they stopped feeding them. But once we, I mean, these cameras really did, and we might, I mean, you know, we'll do, we're gonna put the cameras from beginning to end next year on a few nests, so we'll have better data. Um, we had problems, we put the, the, the cameras, you know, um, anything moving, it turns on and records. So, so they'd end up, you know, taking a whole bunch of videos of, um, of moving palms in the wind, and then the batteries died in three days. So we have these little, little so, so we, you know, this was a initial, but, but we still made some incredible discoveries. But it, it makes total sense to me um, that, that there's a period where, you know, first of, it's like, I, I feel like you can separate breed, uh, the breeding macaws into three parts. The first part where they're young chicks and they need absolute attention and a lot of cleaning, and this clearly has to do with parasites. So, so there's always an adult in the nest, they're very vulnerable. And then there's a period where it's just feed them like crazy and just feed them and feed them and feed them. And you'll see pictures where their crop is just full of food and just get them fat, you know? And then I think it's all right. Now that's enough of this. It's time for them to fledge and the feeding really reduces, the contact reduces. And it's really the, you know, I mean, I mean, to me, I mean, I was, I was really hoping with the camera traps, we get some of the chicks coming out and whatever. And it doesn't, it doesn't appear like, like they're, there's sort of, it's, it's a situation where when they leave the box, that's it. They're done and they're flying with the parents and, and the box is over. That, that part of their life is over. And I, I thought it was gonna be more of, you know, I, I was hoping to get there with video and you have the chicks like trying to fly and they flap back and they're up and they're doing all these great, it, it doesn't seem to be that at all. Um, so maybe there's an element of vulnerability of the box and, and the chicks are safer out with the parents hidden somewhere different every night than, than the box, but um, so so I think I think that's it. I guess the parents make a judgment. All right, you're healthy now. Now the goal is to is no more getting you fat. It's now getting you flying, and and I mean that hanging. I mean they're very social birds and everything. I mean it's got to be, you know these chicks must be just dying that their parents up there and they haven't seen them for two days. They haven't eaten. I mean it's gonna it's a good motor motivator. You know tough love. You know so. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we'll get more and more data with the camera traps and that, that'll be pretty neat to, to get, you know, see how that fledging process works. Yeah, speaking of the boxes, uh, do you have to clean them out between seasons? Uh, between seasons we do. I, and I wonder, I wonder if we, I mean, they're pretty clean. Um, but, but, but what, what our Cesar says is that <clears throat> it's, he likes to put in fresh um, bedding. And I think, I think in a natural cavity situation, what you'd get is the macaws would return the next year and they would chew and eat sort of enough wood that that would fall and create a new level of bedding. Okay. But during the breeding period, you don't need to, you don't need to clean the boxes. The parents take care of all that. Have you thought of putting cameras up in the box, actually aimed in the box so you can watch what's yeah. going on? Yeah, we, we actually did do that. We had a person do their master's thesis and they filmed it all and then they never wrote it up. And now we're actually looking for money to write that up. Um, but yeah, uh, that's, that's going to be our next step. The one, the one we did, we had, um, the name for it, those, those, is it endoscope? I don't know in Spanish, but yeah. yeah, we had one of those cameras in the box, but, you, but at that, that, that point of technology, the person actually had to go there and sit there and turn the machine on and record a tape, um, and then turn it off. And so there, there, we've got like, 50 hours of, you know, nest boxes that someone needs to sit down and go through. But, um, but yeah, I, I think, I mean, it's, it's amazing, these, you know, these, uh, these camera traps, what, what things we're learning. So, you know. I, I would, you know, I don't know about the technology of that, but I just kind of wonder, like my alarm, my motion detectors, my alarm system don't just detect motion. It also has to have a heat signature. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, a mm -hmm. window blind waving would not set it off. It, it has to be a heat signature and motion. So I would think that camera traps would have that. So that way you wouldn't get all the waving palms in there, waste, wasting your battery. 
Uh, yeah, um, that's something we want to look at because in the savanna, we we always have more success with nest boxes in in forests because there's less movement. But in the savanna, we were we were trying to look into sort of a, a heat sensor or laser. I've been actually every time I go to North America and I go into a photography store, I ask them about trigger devices, what they have, and it's amazing how they usually just go. I went to B and H in New York City, you know, thinking, okay, this is the place. And they said, yeah, no, we don't, we don't, we don't have that kind of stuff. Really? Like, but, um, but yeah, looking at, at what, and that, that's something we're going to look into because one of the problems is, is that the birds start, they fly out of the box and fly into the box so quickly that the video doesn't turn on. And we have all these videos of the box that are shaking a little bit. And we just have to assume either the bird flew out or flew in. So, so we, we need to look at also like a triggering device. Uh, there, there, I don't know if you said there's a Facebook group called it's something like bad bird photos or something. It's like where you post your worst yeah. <laughs> bird and all of them are like this blur going this way or that way, <laughs> which is what 95% of your bird photos are until you get that like one. Yeah, one yeah. Right? I can say Bert's a professional photographer, right, Bert? Yeah. yeah well, you know, the, the, the problem with those cameras is. Uh, unlike your security system, they're not infrared sensors. Uh, yeah. Your security system is sensing infrared, which sensors heat. Sensors heat, uh, but security cameras just basically have an algorithm that sense motion. And some of the security cameras have algorithms that can now detect people as opposed to shadows. Right. Uh, but that's pretty hard, and it's not an exact, certainly not an exact science. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's one company you might want to contact. Uh, I don't know if they could help. Uh, it's called WISE, W-Y-Z-E. And WISE has a new outdoor camera that lasts six months on a battery. Uh, and, you know, the issue of getting, you know, the motion after the fact, uh, the only way I know of resolving that is with software. Uh, where actually you're recording all of the time and uh, the software basically kicks in, you know, 10 seconds before it actually senses the motion. So you get a little bit before, uh, but you need a computer at each site to do that. So uh, I'm not sure how you do that, but you know, there, there may be a solution to it. You know, I don't know of it, but I know most security cameras uh, just sense on motion and not on heat. Yeah, we're we're and and like we've got we've bought their hundred dollar camera traps. They're a bit better than the regular ones, but the video quality hasn't been very good. And some of the videos are amazing. So we also want to kind of look into. I think I think you know they, these camera traps. They're putting it all together in a little kit, and that's part of the price. But I think you know you could get like a a cheap DSLR with you know you don't even need a, a super great lens and then just set up a car battery and sometime a trigger triggering device and maybe anyway but, but we really want better video because it's because it's it's amazing some of the stuff that you capture you know well, well the wise cameras do 1080p which is you know a decent video uh, uh -huh. you know it's not you know yeah no that'd be great a video but you know it's, it's decent video and it, they're pretty cheap uh okay. i don't know what their outdoor camera goes for maybe 60 dollars uh, yeah, I heard they're like the top rated uh, security cameras for your home for outside. Also. Yeah, I mean, I, I have three of them. Uh, no, they're, they're indoor cameras. They just came out with an outdoor one and frankly, people haven't been real happy with them. But wow. uh, the indoor ones were $35, or actually $30, I think, which was crazy cheap and they were really high quality. So, and they were, but they work on Wi-Fi. Uh, they also can record to an SD card. So right. you may not need the Wi-Fi. You may be able to just record to the SD card. Yeah, I'm gonna have to learn a lot more about this. It's worth worth the effort though, because uh, some of the images are amazing. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. All right, this sounds good. Looks like you, Sam and Bennett, are going to connect. Um, thank you so much again, Bennett. This was tremendous. I always love hearing from you. Um, if you ever escape from Bolivia again, <laughs> might end up having dinner. So, but so yeah. Bolivia's coat, you said, shut down to the end of the year, right? Uh, I, I have no plan. Probably. And, I yeah. think Argentina said there, that's it, the borders are closed to 2020. So I'm not yeah. sure 
you know, which South American countries are even allowing people. The, the problem is if you leave, you could be in a situation mm -hmm. where you, you're not allowed back in. So yeah. you, know, you always have to consider that, unfortunately. And uh, again, thank you so much. We can do sort of a, um, a visual applause. <laughs> some people have sound, some people don't. It's always kind of interesting on Zoom how you, how you uh, applaud something. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but anyhow, thanks everyone for coming. I'll, I'll be putting the recording up. Uh, actually, I'm gonna stop recording now.